It's hardly controversial to say that horror is probably one of the biggest narrative genres in video gaming, almost reaching the same levels as sci-fi and fantasy, although nowhere near military stories. Join me today as I take a special look into this genre. Part 1 Horror Games and Horror Themed Games Let's start with an important distinction, the one between horror theming in a video game and an outright horror video game. There are many games with horror theming, Castlevania, Doom, Devil May Cry, that don't strictly count as horror games in themselves. Often this is due to an immeasurably important feature in interactive horror, threat. Specifically the threat that monsters or other sources of horror hold over the characters. Take for example Devil May Cry. In Devil May Cry 3, the monsters are introduced in a scene that mostly serves to assert that Dante, and not his enemies, has the power in any given situation. Throughout the game he is absolutely unfazed by what he sees, undaunted by what he fights, and most of the time skips through the sea of monsters as if it didn't even slightly matter that he was facing monsters at all. In a similar vein, although in Castlevania the monsters are a credible threat, in terms of tone and mechanics they're more akin to Goombas than the Scissorman. The appearance of monsters has more in common with fantasy adventure than horror. Thus, I categorise it as simply horror themed, as you could probably replace them with fantasy creatures and not have much real difference to how the game itself plays. In these cases, it feels like calling it horror is like calling Sesame Street horror because it features the Count, who loves to count! However, due to horror being at least partially based in fear, or at least something that's meant to be feared in context, I think it's fair to suggest that games in which you are a high efficiency killing machine are horror themed, as opposed to horror. If you could replace your monsters with any other creature, human or inhuman, and get the same result, you're probably not a horror game. By the way, this distinction goes some way towards explaining the palpable difference between earlier Resident Evil titles and what we got after 4. The fans wanted horror, as opposed to horror-themed Call of Duty. Part 2. Horror Films and Horror Games. The Difference. Noel Carroll describes art horror as a series of emotional responses as being a mixture of fear and disgust at impurity, when the thought of a situation is entertained. I may be grossly simplifying his thesis, but it goes a long way towards explaining how horror works in traditional mediums. See his book for more. However, it doesn't seem to go all the way when video games are considered as the medium for horror. If you take a horror movie for example, as a viewer you assimilate art horror emotions by entertaining the thoughts of what happens on screens, and placing those events within the context of your own experience. Your reactions to the film are predominantly passive, unless you're the kind to run away from movies when you see something scary. This is because, in this case, you are the observer. You are watching horrible, horrifying things happen, but they're happening to other people, separated from you by the fourth wall. When you play a game, you are interacting directly with the world, and you are the primary agent. Although it could be seen as indirect, it isn't, and you are the one who controls the actions of the player character. This slight but significant challenge to the formula makes all of the difference where this medium is involved. At face value, this changes the status of the monsters, and therefore your response behaviours to horror stimuli. When you introduce a goal in a failure state, monsters aren't just objects of fear, but they're an obstacle of progress. Whether or not what is felt towards them is fear is debatable at this point, but this impediment is at the very least a necessity to improve game quality, and is at least part of why our behaviours towards horror change when the medium is changed. However, impediment alone is not what makes the difference so enormous. Through a mixture of world building, high quality production, and the agency that is the core difference between film and video games, we achieve something traditional art horror can't quite manage. Immersion. Most clearly evidenced, to my knowledge, in Alien Isolation, an immersive experience takes that daft step away from Carol's thought theory and towards something more akin to self-delusion, but not quite. Before I start praising how certain games manage this, allow me to clarify. As mentioned earlier, in a video game the player acts not as an observer but the primary agents, and your fingertips are direct control over the player character. 
the player takes the role of the character's mind, with all the experience and desire for self-preservation that that entails. You aren't simply picking up the puppet strings and playing pretend monsters, you are directly interacting with the game's world through the body of the player character. For all intents and purposes, you are the player character. The impact this has on horror is huge. It makes gameplay less like watching a horror film and more like being one of those haunted house experiences. In many ways, this makes our horror responses more genuine in the case of a video game than it is in the greatest of horror films. As we are responding to stimuli which are essentially aimed at us directly. Part 3. The Importance of World Building and Atmosphere in Conjunction Since the idea is that you become the primary nerve centre for the player character, immersion suffers if the world doesn't feel authentic. I'm not saying that it needs to be high definition wonderment, I'm saying it needs to appear authentic. For a fictional world to be believable, it doesn't need to mirror our own, as much as make sense within context. Within horror, this comes down to general atmosphere coupled with smaller world-building details. Take for example the outlandish setting of Resident Evil. On a primary level, it holds atmosphere through cinematic camera angles, the dark tones, and its mostly minimal sound design. But also there is detail to the world. Almost like a point-and-click adventure, you can investigate almost everything. On top of this are the readable files, where we see written accounts giving us grisly hints at horrors to come. Or in modern games, and the ever-popular audio log. These world-building aspects build tension, making the game more authentic, as well as creating dread for the future. Even in a science fiction context such as an alien isolation, attention to detail helps make this horrifying scenario shine. As well as referencing the parent series, the ruined text surrounding you on this particular title puts you directly into the game's world. A feature I've touched on is sound design. Especially within this genre, it has become apparent that sound is key. Whether it's good use of music, or cleverly put together soundscapes, audio detail is as important as visual. The world is an entire package. It's not enough to be dimly lit and chuck in a few jump scares. Most of the job of horror is done before a conflict occurs, or between conflict. As an aside... A feature seen quite often in recent times is extensive use of first-person perspective. This initially helps immersion simply through its similarities to the perspective we're used to in reality. It also makes our interactions more meaningful as our field of view is limited to, near enough, those of the character. Although it's not a be-all, end-all approach to the genre, it's definitely been welcome where it has worked. These features aren't exactly the tried and true, tested formula of how to do horror. There's obviously a lot more to it than this, and also a lot more obvious things, which I haven't really mentioned. But I think some of these aren't really delved into very much. Part 4. The Importance of Difficulty Curves for Immersion One important task a horror game must complete is keeping the experience going. Between the game itself and the player, this isn't exactly the simplest thing. As I've mentioned before, a necessity for a horror game is credible threat. If monsters are too easily felled, don't pose a threat to the player, or simply don't show up, it ceases being a horror experience, as opposed to a separate kind of game in a horror costume. However, it can go too far the other way, either by action of the player, or by the game. Be prepared, we're about to head into Anecdote Central. Our first tale is one of Lur, a daring young man who played Amnesia the Dark Descent, with the brightness maxed out. He proclaimed, I can't see a thing otherwise! Not understanding that that was the point, the illusion was smote. The monsters and the spooky castle became a joke, the sanity effects became a mere hindrance, and the game became Frogger with poor voice acting. Remaining with Amnesia, a young man by the name of Josh became frustrated by repeatedly being slaughtered. He screamed, There's nowhere to hide! There's nowhere to hide! And he ran repeatedly into the arms of the creature until the game took pity on him and became nothing 
but a tour of a lonely castle, with no company but a naked old man. Returning to our brave hero Lur, he downloaded the extra DLC only difficulty for Alien Isolation for his first go, turning the game once again to an avoid em up of a different kind. Repeated deaths as different tactics were attempted changed the game from horror into a high stakes game of tag, where fear turns to competition and eventually frustration. Those really happened. But besides which, they illustrate that it's not just the game that needs to keep the immersion going, but also the player. And although this kind of relationship sort of happens elsewhere, it rarely has the level of codependence that you see within horror games. If you aren't careful, you can end up with a completely different experience, but it isn't exactly how it's intended to be experienced. Part 5. Why Horror is Important Normally when we talk about video game genres, or talk about video games in general, the narrative is at best secondary. We don't talk about fantasy, sci-fi, detective fiction, military fiction, romance or comedy. We use tags like first person shooter, platformer, driving game, fighting game, beat em up, hack and slash, RPG, action adventure, stealth games, the list goes on. The fact that there's even a genre for a game in which you play a role, when technically that should be all of them. As a culture, video gamers appear to be more concerned with how they interact with a game world than with what the game world contains. The narrative is fit around the needs of the gameplay, but horror does it the other way around. Since at least the 90s, we've been seeing horror as an example of developers intentionally fitting the gameplay around the narrative genre which has in turn led to people talking about it differently, in a way that doesn't alienate people outside of the know. Let me put it like this. If you said to an octogenarian that you like to play first person shooters, I think it wouldn't be unexpected for them to not really understand what you're on about. But it might be a fairer assumption that they'd know what you meant if you talked to them about horror or fantasy or any other common knowledge narrative genre that basically every other medium uses as a matter of course. Of course, gameplay genres are very important. I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't admit that. How you interact with that world is incredibly important to how you experience that world. However, having a narrative genre stand up on its own as an important thing if we want this art form to be recognised outside of our own little circles feels like we should be directing the conversation somewhere else. And at least in horror games, it seems like that is the case. Although maybe Five Nights at Freddy's isn't really helping our case. 